Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, friends and visitors. A very warm welcome to our English worship service. We are glad that you are able to join us in worship this morning. Before we begin, just a gentle reminder to turn your mobile phones to the silent or the flight mode. Let us now take a moment to quieten our hearts and minds, to put away all distractions, and to focus and come before our Creator with a moment of silent prayer. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. This morning we will sing the Reformation hymn as our opening song. This song reminds us of our salvation by grace through faith. The songwriter says, He has freed us, He will keep us, till we are safely home. Glory be to God alone. We will sing this song with some variations, starting with the brother singing the part one of the song. You will see the variations on the slide, so please watch out on the slides. Let us all rise and give praise and glory to God.
us remain standing as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege to gather to worship you. We thank you that it is your love and grace that has saved us, even though we are undeserving sinners. We are reminded of your mercy toward us through your Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins. Help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses of your love, your grace and truth in this world that needs your light. May our words and conduct truly reflect the goodness and bring glory to your name. As we wait for your return, may we live each day with surrendered hearts, ready to follow wherever you may lead. Let us trust in your divine plan and surrender our lives to you, knowing that you are our ever-present help in times of need. We trust in your perfect plan and wisdom and ask that you mold us into vessels of your grace and love. We commit this time of worship to you and we ask that you open our hearts as you speak to us through your servant, Deacon YY, this morning. Let us not only be hearers, but doers of your word. And may our worship this morning be pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Our PBCC Creed summarizes foundational beliefs of our Christian faith. When we recite it together, we affirm these truths, reflecting who God is and what He has done, and our response of faith. We call upon all believers to participate in worship by stating what we believe together with conviction. Let us begin. I believe there is one true God, creator of all. I believe God created man in His image to glorify Him, but as a result of Adam's fall, all men are separated from God by sin. I believe Jesus is God in the flesh, virgin born and without sin, who was crucified for our sins, buried and rose the third day. I believe Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and through his substitutionary atonement, we who believe obtain forgiveness of sin and eternal life with God. I believe the Holy Spirit is God who indwells us to believe, enabling us to live for Christ. I believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, which is without error. I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is commissioned to preach the Gospel and make disciples, looking forward to His return. Last week, we remembered our Lord's death and resurrection at Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We celebrate the living hope because God has called us out of darkness into His marvellous light. We have been cleansed with Calvary's blood. We will sing our next song, Christ is Sufficient. We will sing stanzas 1 and 2, followed by the chorus, and then stanzas 3 and 4, and then the chorus.
Offering is part of worship, and we thank the Lord that the offering collected last week from the 28th and... Can we have the slides for the offering? Thank you. Yeah, the, we thank the Lord that the offering collected last week from the 28th of March to the 3rd of April was $17,977. Let us all pray and give thanks to God for the offering that was collected. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today with grateful hearts, giving thanks for the blessings you have bestowed upon us and to our church. Today, we thank you for the offering that was collected and we recognize that everything comes from you. May this offering please you as it is presented gratefully and willingly. May it symbolize the spiritual worship we strive for in presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. Thank you for the privilege to participate in your kingdom building work and we ask for wisdom and discernment for those who will steward these resources that they may be used in accordance with your will to further your kingdom, to bless those in need, and to spread your love and word to those around us. May your love and grace be shown in all that we do and say, and, we may, and we, may we continue to honour you with our giving. Please bless this time of worship, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from a portion of today's sermon text, Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 30, 31. Please follow as I read. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he may bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Street, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptised and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased it all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who live in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But the disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road had he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among, 
among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. We thank the Lord for the reading of his holy word. To prepare our hearts to receive God's word, let us sing our next song, I Surrender All. For stanzas, for stanza two, we will sing it in a cappella. This morning, Deacon YY will deliver the Lord's message taken from Acts chapter 9 and also 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it's titled, The Legitimacy of Paul the Apostle. Deacon YY. Thanks, Deacon Gabriel. Uh, good morning to all those who are here and those who are joining us on live stream. Do keep your Bibles open to Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 31, if you haven't already done so. Our passage this morning is taken from Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 31. Before we begin, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word to us revealed in the Bible. Father, we know all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Father, so please help us today, as we think of the legitimacy of the Apostle Paul, that we be certain of his apostleship, that we be certain that all of your word is profitable for us, to complete us, to equip us for every good work. Please help us this morning to respond rightly to your word. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, would you support and trust a man who says offensive words, who holds unpopular views, and has even been convicted by the law? Uh, this year appears to be a year of elections. Uh, in the US, elections will be held this year uh, between the incumbent Joe Biden and his predecessor, Donald Trump. Uh, in Singapore, our general elections will also be held this year. But imagine, imagine if any candidate has a record of saying words that can be considered offensive to some. Imagine if his views are very unpopular. And imagine if he has even been imprisoned before. Uh, personally, I would find it very hard to trust someone like that. Uh, and yet, all of these things can be said of the Apostle Paul. Uh, the story of Acts ended with Paul under house arrest. Uh, in Paul's letters, you'll find many things that are definitely unpopular, and many would even consider offensive. 
Uh, because it was Paul who wrote, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans 1 verse 18. Uh, it's Paul who wrote that men who practice homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9. Uh, it's Paul who wrote, wives, submit to your husbands. Ephesians 5 verse, 30, verse 22. Uh, it's the same Paul who wrote that if anyone preaches a different gospel to what he preached, they should be cursed. Galatians 1 verse 8. Uh, you know, if Paul lived in our day and age, he would surely be the first to be cancelled. Uh, but sadly, it's not just the world out there that's uncomfortable with Paul. Uh, some today who even call themselves Christians, uh, they get uncomfortable with Paul as well. Uh, they try to drive a wedge between Jesus and Paul. And they conclude that it is Paul, the Apostle Paul, who corrupted and deviated from Jesus' teachings. Uh, back when I was a student in NUS, I remember being in a Bible study. Uh, we were studying the Gospel of Mark, and I recall one of the group members, and uh, he, he's quite a regular member, and as far as could, I could tell, he was from a mainstream church. Uh, but he said this during the study, that our conclusion on Jesus' teachings in Mark's Gospel, uh, we were shaded by a Pauline lens, that we got Jesus wrong, we, we read his Gospels wrongly, because we are influenced by Paul. So it's not just non-Christians, but even Christians can get uncomfortable with Paul. Uh, doubts about Paul actually go way back, uh, back in the early church in the first century. Uh, Paul was probably the apostle under the most scrutiny. Uh, twice in Acts, as we saw last year, uh, Paul had to defend the fact that he was an apostle sent by Jesus to preach the gospel. Uh, the Corinthians in the Corinthian church, uh, they didn't think Paul was a real apostle, because he looked like a weak apostle. Uh, they thought the super apostles, uh, those who appeared wise to the world, those who are eloquent, those with charisma, uh, they thought that the super apostles, they were the real deal, not Paul. Uh, likewise, in Galatians, Paul had to defend his apostleship as well, uh, because there were many in the Galatian church who doubted Paul's message, uh, particularly his message that Gentiles can be considered God's children. Now, this is an important issue for us to address because Paul, he's a significant contributor to our New Testament. Now, 13, 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament were written by Paul. So here's the question, is Paul really legit? Now, is he really Jesus' chosen apostle? Can we trust Paul? Should we listen to Paul's teachings? Uh, this morning, we're covering Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 31, and this sermon is part of our Acts flashback series. Uh, the aim of today's message is this, that as we read Acts chapter 9, as we look at other parts of the New Testament, uh, we can be sure that Paul is a legit apostle. And that means we can trust Paul's words. That means we can stand behind his teaching as the word of God. Uh, four points for today, and the first point First point, Paul was commissioned by Christ, Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 9. Uh, the first nine verses of Acts chapter 9, they tell us about Paul's miraculous conversion. Uh, previously in Acts, we recall Paul being the great persecutor of the church. Uh, he was kind of like the secret police, the, the, the Gestapo, uh, going around hunting Christians. We see the same in verse 1 to 2. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As Saul or Paul, he was still breeding threats and murder against Christians. Uh, he even took the initiative to ask for a warrant to go and catch Christians at Damascus. But the next few verses will change Paul's story completely. Verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. Now, Paul, he was on his way to arrest Christians, but here we see the Lord Jesus arresting Paul. 
A light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shone on Paul, so bright, so strong, that Paul fell on the ground. And Jesus says to him, I am Jesus. Uh, oh no, uh, Paul thought Jesus was dead. Uh, but if Jesus is alive, then Paul has been going the wrong direction. His entire life direction must change. Uh, this is Paul's first encounter with the living and risen Jesus. Uh, Jesus calls him by name Saul, Saul. Uh, it's here. It's here that Paul was chosen by Jesus. Uh, Paul recounts this in Acts chapter 26 before King Agrippa. Acts chapter 26, verse 15, this is Paul speaking, And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Uh, it was here at the road to Damascus that Paul was converted and chosen by Jesus to be sent out by Jesus as an apostle to preach the gospel all over the world. At this point, you might be thinking, wait, hold on. Uh, why does Jesus need to choose another apostle? Uh, I thought there were already 12 apostles. Uh, 12 apostles, right? Uh, that's right. Uh, Paul is actually not part of the 12 apostles. Uh, the 12 apostles were chosen in Acts chapter 1, but Paul here, he is a bonus apostle. Uh, hear what Paul says about himself in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. Uh, when he appeared uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, uh, he was talking about the witnesses whom Jesus appeared to. And so in, in the previous few verses, he lists all of the apostles that seen Jesus. But after listing all of these apostles, verse 8, Paul adds, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he, Jesus, appeared also to me. And Paul, he wasn't part of the original 12. He was one untimely born, but he's still an apostle for a special reason. Uh, the context of Acts will help us to know why. Uh, recall Jesus' plan in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 to advance his kingdom from where? From Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And by Acts chapter 9, the gospel has already reached stage 2, Judea and Samaria. Now, stage 2 is about to be completed. Stage 3 is going to start. And now, in Acts 9, at the cusp of the Gentile mission, and Paul is now chosen by Jesus to be his apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, he is the 13th apostle, uh, 12 apostles chosen, a very special and significant number for Israel. Uh, but now, but now as the gospel proceeds to the ends of the world, the risen Lord Jesus appears to Paul and commissions him as an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, this is how Paul describes this in Galatians. Galatians 1 verse 14. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he, who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And Paul was commissioned by Christ to be his apostle. Okay, great. Uh, we could actually end the sermon here. Uh, but a skeptical might ask, wait, 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 hold on. Uh, all of this so far, these are just Paul's own words. Uh, you know, anybody can claim anything, right? Uh, anybody can claim that they receive a divine re revelation. And if nobody saw it, uh, it's just my word against yours. Uh, which brings us to our next point. Ananias. Ananias confirms Paul was chosen. Acts 9, verse 10 to 19. Uh, so far, nobody has heard of Paul's encounter with Jesus. Uh, the guys that were with Paul, they were his soldiers. They only heard sounds, but they did not see Jesus. But now, enter Ananias. And Ananias will give us our first independent confirmation. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. 
The Lord said to him in the vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Street. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So separately, Jesus also spoke to Ananias, who is a disciple. Uh, remember the shock that Ananias had when he heard these words. Verse 13. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Uh, imagine Ananias' shock. Uh, Jesus, are you sure? Uh, don't you know this is the guy? This is the guy who has been going around arresting Christians. There was initial doubt. Uh, Ananias, he didn't believe this at first. But listen to what Ananias recounts about what the Lord Jesus said to him. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Now, Jesus doesn't simply commission Paul and expect everyone to, 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 to believe Paul. Now, Jesus said the same thing to Ananias. And he tells Ananias, go find Paul. And here Paul was baptized. And here Ananias can confirm Paul is really a born-again Christian. He's a true, genuine convert. He's a brother. And more than that, he's commissioned. Ananias laid his hands on him. And Paul is now commissioned to carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles, to the kings, the children of Israel. Uh, this is confirmation number one. Ananias affirms. And Paul really is chosen by Christ, really saved, really appointed for this special task. Uh, you know, if anyone in the early church, if they ever doubted Paul's legitimacy as an apostle, uh, well, they didn't need to speculate because actually all they needed to do was to go down to, to Damascus, find a disciple at Damascus called Ananias and ask him. Uh, that's probably what Luke, the historian, did. Uh, it's likely he went down to ask Ananias and it was Ananias who recounted how Jesus appeared to him and called him to lay his hands on Paul to heal him. Uh, Ananias confirms Paul was chosen by Jesus. Uh, but there's more confirmation than that. Let's look at point three. Point three, apostles and the early church confirmed Paul was chosen. Verse 26 to 31. So the story continues. Paul, he finally ends up in Jerusalem. And again, we see the same pattern. There was initial doubt, but then confirmation. Verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Now Paul, he's here, he's back in Jerusalem, and these were the same people who Paul has persecuted just a few months ago. Understandably, of course, they were afraid of him. Uh, they didn't know him as Paul the preacher now. They only knew of him as Paul the persecutor. But Barnabas confirms Paul's authenticity. Look at verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Barnabas. Barnabas brought Paul to the apostles and recounted Paul's conversion and commission, and how Paul had seen the risen Lord Jesus, and how Paul preached Jesus boldly. Barnabas confirms his legitimacy. I remember how the apostles were witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. And now Paul as well. Uh, Paul is one who has seen also the risen Lord Jesus, uh, albeit in a special way. And the apostles, they confirmed his status. Paul could remain at Jerusalem, going in and out among them to preach boldly, to dispute, to reason with those who don't believe. 
and beyond Acts, uh, Peter, actually the Apostle Peter himself, he also affirms Paul's apostleship. Uh, in Peter's last letter, 2 Peter, uh, Peter himself, he actually affirms that what Paul writes is authoritative scripture. Uh, that's what Paul says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 to 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, this is Peter writing, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Uh, do you see what Paul is saying here? Uh, first of all, notice that the recipients of Peter's letter, uh, these churches, they've also received Paul's letters. Uh, look at verse 15. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you. Uh, Peter was writing to churches in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Uh, all of these are places in Asia Minor. And we know that Paul has himself also planted quite a few churches there. And so here, Peter, the apostle, he's writing to these churches and he's telling them, you better believe what I'm saying. Which, by the way, Paul, the other apostle, has also been telling the same things to you. And what was Peter's point? Uh, Peter's big aim in 2 Peter was to tell his readers, Jesus is returning in judgment, live in light of that truth. Uh, but how does Peter convince his readers? Uh, three ways. Uh, first of all, he talks about his own apostleship, 1 verse 1, how his own eyewitness testimony as an apostle, that's in chapter 1 verse 16. Uh, but then he appeals also to the Old Testament scriptures, 1 verse 21 and 3 verse 2, the prophets, what the prophets have said. And lastly, he appeals to Paul's letters, what the Apostle Paul also wrote. Now Peter, he's affirming Paul as an apostle. Uh, his words, Paul's words, carry the same authority. Uh, so it's not just Paul's own words that he claims that he's a genuine apostle. Uh, it's not just one other person, Ananias, supporting Paul. Uh, here we have the rest of the apostles affirming Paul. And Peter himself writing this in his final letter. Uh, is Paul a legit apostle? Well, if, if anyone in the early church had doubts, uh, they could go to Damascus and ask Ananias. Uh, they could also go to Jerusalem and ask the apostle Peter. Uh, Peter and the rest of the apostles, they would gladly affirm Paul. Uh, as he did in his final letter. Uh, but let's move on to our final point. Paul's actions assure us he is legitimately an apostle, verse 20 to 31. So we've seen Ananias confirming Paul. We've seen the apostles confirming Paul. But what about Paul's own actions? Uh, were his own actions actually suspicious? Or will his actions give us more confidence? that he was truly chosen by Jesus to preach the gospel to the nations. Uh, let's go back to Paul's actions immediately after he was commissioned. Uh, so having been commissioned, confirmed by Ananias, so Paul, he joined the church at Damascus. Look at what Paul does immediately, verse 19. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. Uh, the first thing that Paul does immediately to proclaim Jesus. Uh, Paul wastes no time. He goes to work immediately. He preaches Christ. He tells all in the synagogue, Jesus is the Christ. And look at the response of those who were there. Verse 21. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who, were lived, who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Uh, the crowds who were in the synagogue, they expected Paul to say, death to the Christians, got to catch them all. But instead, they hear Paul saying, guys, have you not read the Old Testament? Have you not that Jesus, whom you crucified, is the Christ, the Son of God? Uh, have you not known that he is the promised king? Uh, Jesus is a descendant of David who came to rescue us from sin. 
Now, the crowds at the synagogue, they were confounded, verse 22. They were shocked. Now, why is Paul now preaching Jesus? Immediately at Damascus, Paul does exactly what Jesus called him to do, carrying the name of Jesus before the Gentiles, the kings, and the children of Israel. Now, here he is at the synagogue proclaiming Jesus as an apostle. Now, but Paul doesn't just preach he also willingly suffers for Christ. Verse 23. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were, waiting, they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And the Jews, they wanted to murder Paul. So Paul, he escapes in a very humiliating fashion. Lower in a basket in the middle of the night, escaping the city like a common criminal. Now we see this, Paul saying this in Philippians 3. Now in just a few days, Paul, he lost everything. His reputation amongst the Pharisees, his social standing, his status, all of that lost. But he endures and persists in knowing Christ. Paul willingly suffers as an apostle. Uh, you know, in, in those days, uh, nobody would want to be called an apostle. Uh, maybe today, maybe today it will be advantageous to call yourself an apostle, right? It gives you a lot of power and authority in Christian circles. But back then, there's no advantage to be called an apostle. Uh, because if you call yourself an apostle, all it does, it paints a huge red target on your back. It will be wanted by Jews and the Romans. And that's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, that's one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Verse 27, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak. Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. Verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the king under, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket, threw a window in the wall, and escaped his hands. And brothers and sisters, this was Paul's boast or proof. Proof to the Corinthians that he was a legit apostle. Uh, not as the other fake apostles would claim. Uh, the fake super apostles, they will point to their success. They will point to their wisdom, their eloquence. But Paul? And Paul points to his suffering, to his weakness. Uh, because a fake apostle would compromise. Uh, why lie if it brings you suffering? Why lie if it leads you to your death? And yet Paul insists, he is a real apostle. Look at my sufferings. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 17, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Suffering, persecution, they help weed out those who are fake. And Paul's actions, they assure us he's authentic. And Paul, he sticks to his commission. He preaches Jesus immediately. And he's not doing this for any personal gain or power. In fact, all of that brought him, only brought him pain and suffering and persecution, finally death. And he suffers alongside the rest of the apostles for Jesus' gospel. But let's conclude. And we started today with the question, is Paul legitimately an apostle? I hope you've seen from Acts 9 and the rest of the New Testament, Paul is legitimately an apostle of Christ. And Ananias can confirm it. The apostle Peter can confirm them. Can, can, can confirm Paul. And Paul's own actions, they are consistent with his calling. Uh, Paul is really Jesus' chosen apostle. 
Uh, so two applications this morning. And number one, be certain of Paul's apostleship. Uh, to the early church, there would have been doubts about Paul. And the temptation for the early church is to distance themselves from Paul. And perhaps the opponents to Paul, they pointed at the fact that Paul was in prison. Uh, it's hard to put your trust in someone who has been jailed, who, who, is, who is facing a death sentence. Uh, perhaps they say, you know, Paul can't be an apostle. His teachings are way too extreme, way too offensive. Uh, that's why the Jews put him in jail. Or perhaps other opponents would point and look at Paul and say, look at his sufferings. Look at his weak ministry. Uh, of course, he can't be a real apostle. Uh, he's not as eloquent, not as influential as us. But these passages show us Paul is real. His brushes with the law, his impending sentence, all of that is actually planned by Jesus. Uh, Jesus has already said to him from day one, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. His prison sentence, his sufferings, his weakness, uh, they actually point to Paul's legitimacy as an apostle, not the other way around. Uh, so to the early church, Luke will tell them, don't distance yourself from Paul. Even though Paul may be in prison now, uh, realize Paul is fulfilling his commission. Don't distance yourself from him. He is chosen by Jesus. Uh, what about us today? Uh, will we be tempted to distance ourselves from Paul? Uh, you, may hear, you may hear some claim that Paul distorted Christianity. Uh, you may even hear another religion claim that Paul is a false prophet, that Paul hijacked the followers of Jesus, that Paul corrupted Jesus' teachings, that Paul created his own religion. Now, when we hear those claims, be certain, Paul was chosen by Jesus. His apostleship is confirmed. Ask Ananias, ask the rest of the apostles. Now, there's no viable motive for Paul to try and hijack Christianity. All that brings him, well, will only bring him a death sentence and prison sentence. And trust Paul. Now, be certain that Paul is an apostle. But second application, now, be certain about Paul's teachings. Now, Paul wrote a huge part of the New Testament, 13, almost half, 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament were written by Paul's own hand. Uh, if Paul is a genuine apostle, then his letters in Scripture are authoritative. His words are inspired by the Holy Spirit when we read Romans, when we read Galatians or Ephesians, uh, all of those letters are authoritative. Uh, in the early church, there was pressure to distance themselves from Paul's teachings, and especially Paul's controversial one, that Gentiles were included as part of God's family. Uh, the popular teaching then was to teach that only Jews are the true people of God. Uh, if you wanted to be part of God's people, you must become a Jew then. Uh, be circumcised, follow the law, obey the law. A salvation, as they would say, is attained by obeying the law, not by faith in Jesus. But Paul opposed these teachings in Romans and in Galatians, even though it made him unpopular. And so to the early church, to Christians like Theophilus then, they must stand firm. Paul's teachings are right. They are consistent with Jesus. They are consistent with the rest of the apostles. For them then, they must trust in Paul's teachings. Now, likewise, today there's pressure to distance ourselves from Paul because it is Paul who wrote views on, on, on sin, and the wrath of God, homosexuality, marriage. Now, all of these views are extremely unpopular today. Now, these are the views, these are the very views that will get Christians cancelled. But what is our response? We stick to Paul's teachings. We be certain that what Paul taught is what Jesus taught. Uh, when Paul's teachings seem countercultural, uh, don't reach for the excuse that Paul, you know, Paul, maybe Paul wasn't a real apostle, uh, like others may have done. Because Paul's words in Scripture, as inspired in Scripture, they are Jesus' words. If you have a problem with Paul's teachings on God's wrath, on sin, on hell, on judgment, on marriage, on godliness, on church, then I have to tell you, your problem is not just with Paul. You will have a problem with Jesus. But the next time you hear someone dismiss Paul's words in his letters, 
Well, have confidence. Have confidence that Paul's words are authoritative. His words in Scripture are Jesus' words. Don't fall into the trap of saying, I'll only listen to Jesus, I won't listen to Paul. Because Paul's words in Scripture, they are inspired words of God. Paul is a legit apostle. He is Jesus' chosen instrument, affirmed by the early church and the apostles. His teaching, his ministry is aligned with the other apostles. Paul's words in Scripture are authoritative. They are Jesus' words. So trust Paul, Jesus' apostle. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your sovereignty in choosing your apostles to send them out authoritatively authoritatively to preach and teach your gospel. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul, your apostle to the Gentiles, of which we have benefited immensely from his ministry. Father, we are thankful that Paul endured and suffered as your apostle, and that your kingdom may advance to the ends of the earth, even to our tiny island here in Singapore. Father, we ask today that you will grow our confidence in your words. Help us to be certain of the Apostle Paul. Help us to be certain that what he wrote as inspired by your Holy Spirit is indeed your authoritative word. Please guard us against those who oppose your word. Please guard us against those who would try to pit your apostles against Jesus. Help us to be confident that Paul's words in Scripture are your words. Father, help us to stand firm, to hold fast to all your words in Scripture. Pray that we'll treasure them. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'd like to welcome uh, two friends in our midst, uh, they are Gihan's, brother Gihan's colleague. Uh, the person is Dill and also Olivia. Dill is from Philippines and Olivia is from Germany. Can you please stand? Yes, let's say amen to welcome them. Amen. Thank you, Ms. So good to come to the house of God. And we understand that uh, our senior pastor is not well. Uh, uh, let's pray for him. And uh, let's now prepare our hearts to uh, take the Holy Communion together. The Holy Communion, as we take, is to look back at our Saviour, his death at the cross, that he died for our sins. Not only to look back, but to look forward to his second coming. Let's spend a time, a silent prayer to prepare hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, to receive thy goodness, thy blessing, and even to remember our Saviour as we partake the Lord's Supper together. Lord, you help us to give thanks that, oh Lord, you send your begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. And because of him, we have the saving grace. And whosoever believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you, God, for your love for us as we partake the bread and the cup. Reminds us of his sacrificial love for us. His blood was shed to cleanse away all our sins. Thank you, God, for your love for sinners like us. Thank you, God, for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Now we shall read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 32. I'd like to read the first uh, 23, then the congregation will take this uh, 24, and we will alternate till we reach 32. Let me start. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered, delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on that the night when he was betrayed took bread. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let the person Is that the one? Yes, thank you. <laughs> but let but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. What? Sorry. Yes. Just now? Okay, let my I'm sorry. Okay, let me read twenty nine. Something wrong with my eyes. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks this judgment on himself. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Amen. Thank God for the reading of His precious Word. It's good to make mistakes. All right, we concentrate on God's Word more. TPCC would like to invite all that have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, baptized in the Protestant Church, and have prepared their hearts to partake the Lord's Supper. Let's do that. All right. Now let us take out our cup together. Let's peel the very first layer, which is the hardest part. Look, look around. Those that may have some problem, let's help one another. If you are ready. And when he have given thanks, he break it and say, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's partake this together. Let's peel off the second layer. After the same manner, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake this together. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful we can come before you at thy table to partake the Lord's Supper together. We pray, God, you continue to work in us, helping us to walk the narrow way and even to be an example, to be Christ-like 
to be a servant that loving you and the people around us. Grant us, Father, the understanding of your promises that you will be coming back for us and we know it's very soon. So come back quickly, O oh Lord. And again, Father, as we continue to serve and love you, may thy Holy Spirit grant us the power and strength to do the things that is right in your sight. Remembering our Saviour at the cross, that he died for us. But we are also thankful that he was buried and he rose again. Thank you, God, for your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy unto your people. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Charles. And we thank the Lord for his message and Deacon YY for delivering it. In closing, let us rise to sing our closing song, Across the Lands. remain standing as we close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you. We thank thee, God, for this wonderful morning that we can come to your house to worship you, to praise your holy name, and to give thanks for your goodness unto your people. Now, O oh God, we like to pray for some brethren that are not well in the body. We pray for one of our deacons recovering in NUH, we pray, Lord, you touch his body. We pray for our senior pastor, Pastor Josh. Lord, you will continue to bless him and help him and comfort him and uh, allow him, O oh God, to be uh, well again. And we pray for one of our brethren too that 
hurt himself during a sport game, we pray God, you too will touch his body that he will recover from his injury. Father, again, we pray for those that are not well, but yet, Lord, we know you have a purpose for us and through times of comfort, through times of pain and trials, we draw closer to you. Father, we pray you will strengthen our church, grant us a joyful heart always and claiming your promise always and always be a faithful servant of thine. Once again, Father, thank you for loving us and granting us this week. This week may it be a wonderful week to praise our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and even forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.